China's leadership change is now complete with Xi Jinping taking over as president and Li Keqiang taking over as premier. The transition wrapped up with a press conference by the newly appointed premier on Sunday. Former U.S. Ambassador to China John Huntsman told me what struck him most about this news conference in part one of our exclusive interview. Well, my, my takeaway was, first of all, you've got, you've got a new premier who is introducing himself, really for the first time as premier, and there are certain things you have to say about, uh, about unity, about uh, the big picture, the China dream. Um, I was looking for the hints of a commitment to expanding civil society, uh, a commitment to greater rule of law, uh, a reiteration of the fight against corruption, which he laid out, I thought, very uh, persuasively. Uh, and he added some things that I thought were, were pretty good uh, in a very sincere way, like, hold me accountable, you and the media, you interest groups watching this play out. If we don't deal with the food safety issues, if we don't deal with uh, our polluted cities, hold me accountable. I thought that was pretty good. One of the things that we're already starting to see, uh, <clears throat> leading by example, we've heard about these meetings where people normally would come in and read their speeches and they yeah. get told, no, put the speeches down, we're going to have a dialogue. Uh, we're also hearing about these trips uh, within the country where it's not as ostentatious as before. Yeah. How important is that in terms of sending signals to others below uh, the top leaders? The symbolism is terribly important. So when I was in China recently, I spoke with a party leader in Nanjing. We were at an event together. There wasn't the red carpet. Uh, the speeches were pared down to five minutes. There weren't uh, the flower girls present. Uh, even talk of, it would have been nice to have a dinner for you, Mr. Ambassador, but we just don't do those things as much anymore. The messaging is getting down into the grassroots, and I think that is important. So the symbolism of all of this, you've got to speak it, but you've got to live it too. And to have Xi Jinping on his recent southern tour, uh, even if it is uh, uh, hyperbole uh, to have traveled in a minivan, uh, and to have members of the standing committee of the Politburo who no longer have traffic stopped for them, at least the, so goes some of the, some of the, 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 the rumor mill, I, I think is powerful in the sense that people are talking about it. They're recognizing that this was a problem before. And if, in fact, these changes are happening, then I think it's a step in the right direction. One of the things he talked about was a self-imposed revolution requiring real sacrifice. It will be painful, but it's necessary for development, and it's demanded by the people. Interesting uh, statement there as well. Demanded by the people. So things are now demanded by the people because the people are speaking up. When you've got 700 million Internet users and tens of millions of bloggers, the, the, the greatest change that I saw as ambassador in Beijing was to hear ministers and vice ministers for the first time say, the people are speaking up on an issue, we have to address it. In the old days, it was the Central Planning Commission tells us we have to do this and that, therefore it must be done. Now it's the voice of the people. And I think that uh, if directed in a reasonable direction toward economic progress and open markets and expanded civil society and rule of law is a good thing. That's the kind of the voice of the people that I think is helpful in, in, uh, in, in a country's development. You talked about the millions. I, I was struck by something that the uh, Prime Minister of Singapore said in this uh, interview this weekend in the Washington Post, where he was talking about social media and the impact it's having there. He said, previously, everything was orderly and predictable. Now there are many more voices, views, and interests, and the outcome is a lot more difficult to predict, and the reactions are more difficult to judge. Is that one of the things that the leadership in China is going to have to deal with as well? There are the uncertainty and the, unpredictable, uh, and the unpredictability of the social networking generation. Let's face it, it's coming on like a tsunami. You can't wish it away. It is very real, and the tools and the technology they're using uh, are uniting the world uh, around uh, issues and around causes. And whether it's air quality, whether it's food safety, whether it's corruption, uh, whether it's income disparities in China, these are all issues that are going to be talked about and talked about in sometimes very unpleasant and, uh, and stinging terms because it's the people's voice that is now presenting them as opposed to a think tank. As they uh, turn inward, which they have to with a lot of the issues you just talked about, uh, pollution key among them, uh, how does that change the relationship with the United States? I would argue there's a whole lot more to do with the United States. I would argue that many of the issues that they're talking about are issues where we have 
made real progress, whether that's in air quality, whether it's in uh, our own expansion of civil society, whether uh, it's uh, in food safety, whether it's in water, in livable cities, in, uh, in terms of uh, reorienting uh, their education to a 21st century model. So I've always argued that the future of the U.S.-China relationship will best be left in the hands of regional and local governments and decision makers. And I say that because Washington and Beijing can only take the relationship so far. At some point, it will be governors and mayors and private parties and institutions of higher education that will forge relationships that will both benefit us and benefit China.